everybody. I'm Kerry Mengerson and I'm here with my colleague Helen Thompson and we're going to talk to you today about our work on making private data open and enhancing decision making through digital atlases. Uh, we come from QUT, uh, Queensland University of Technology and the Centre for Data Science. The Centre for Data Science has about 130 researchers in all aspects of data science and over 100 higher degree research students. We go across the university, so we encompass five faculties. We also have a strong emphasis on external engagement, so about 20 partner organisations from government and commercial entities. And in the centre, we have five core research programs that cover data for discovery, models and algorithms, complex data analytics, responsible data science and human-centred AI. We also have 11 applied domains in data science. So researchers who are working in specific areas of, for example, business, uh, engineering, environment, uh, government systems, sports systems, and so on. So collectively, we're interested in all things data, and in particular, we have a commitment to open data. So we are connected through uh, to other centres for data science across Australia through the Australian Data Science Network. And this Australian Data Science Network has been uh, now instituted for a number of years. We have about 30 different uh, members of the centre with the opportunity then to increase communication across the country to en enhance our reputation both uh, within the country and externally to grow data science research and application and also then to, to trade uh, students and, uh, and other learnings and opportunities across the different nodes. So all of that then brings us to the question of uh, open data and how we might uh, use, uh, obtain open data and then use it for different projects. Now, one of the case studies we'd like to talk to you about is the Australian Cancer Atlas, because we think that this really embodies this real uh, challenge of um, obtaining data and then making it open, especially for health data, and then uh, how we might um, uh, be able to then use that data for real impact. So I'm going to hand over then to my colleague, Helen Thompson, to tell you about the Australian Cancer Atlas. Thanks, Kerry, and um, thanks to the organisers for inviting us to share some of our work. So as Kerry's mentioned, I'd like to discuss a little bit about the, the Cancer Atlas with you. So digital da dashboards and atlases provide a way of making complex information comprehensible. So this allows decision makers to make um, you know, meaningful insights and informed decisions. So you see on this slide, there's a picture of our traditional data life cycle, which typically starts at formulating a question and cycles around through to making a decision. But really we can enter this cycle at, at, at any point. So for example, the data may already have been collected possibly for other purposes or when we do the initial analysis of the data, they, that may prompt us to, to carry out further more complex investigations. So this disruption motivates the need to uh, access data in a more open way. Um, but open data still needs to maintain individuals' privacy. And it also needs to be presented to users, to guide users to make interpretations that are appropriate. So for example, we wouldn't want, want to guide users to make causal links when there is no evidence for it. So the Australian Cancer Atlas allows users to explore and visualize cancer-related data. So we use person-level cancer data from the state cancer registries to produce and map various measures of cancer risk over around 2,000 small areas that make up Australia, and there are about 20 cancers. Uh, the, the colours indicate the different levels of cancer risk, and we can explore the measures for a user-specified um, particular area. So for example, for a particular area, we can compare the, the cancer risks across different types of cancers. Or for a given cancer, we can um, look at how much confidence we have that the estimate is above or below the national average, for example. Um, this interactive map also allows users to compare the, the risks of cancers of the different types of cancers across um, two different areas. 
So that's just to give you some idea of the type of information that's available through the Cancer Atlas. So I've already touched on the first theme of this presentation, which is around creating open data. So I'll expand on that a bit more to describe how we take private person level cancer data and turn it into open model data. Um, then Kerry's going to, to discuss an alternative approach that's federated learning for creating open data and also co um, creating complete data before I return to discuss interpretable data. So in creating open data, there's the challenge of balancing openness with, with privacy. So private data um, often contains sensitive information. So this is a barrier to um, complete transparency. And there are additionally data silos, which are disconnected pockets of information, also hinder um, effective collaboration and um, holistic data insights. So if we consider the um, cancer atlas, the person level uh, information from the cancer registries is it's naturally sensitive, so it can't be made open and available. But what we can do is that we can take that um, person level information and aggregate it up to the small area level, and we can um, create modelled estimates of cancer risk at the small area level using a Bayesian spatial model. So here we consider the number of cancer cases YI in area I to be Poisson distributed, and we just call the mean for that, that um, mu. So that um, mean number of cancer cases is modelled using basically a regression model where there's the normal random error term, but there's also a spatial random effect. So there's also some other um, regresses such as uh, sex, age uh, and geographic remoteness, for example. But this spatial random effect in the, the cancer atlas is modelled using a conditional autoregressive prior. So this allows us to model the um, cancer risk for a particular area as being dependent on the cancer risk in the surrounding areas. So while the, the, the person level information is private and can't be made open, what we can do is we can obtain, um, a, we can obtain posterior estimates from, from the model that, that can be made open. So these, are, these, for example, might be the spatially smooth estimates of the age standardised incidence and relative survival rates for each area, along with their corresponding estimates of uncertainty, or perhaps we may be interested in probabilistic comparisons between areas. So the uh, estimates, the model outputs, the posterior estimates uh, can be made open. So this allows us to make inferences and identify, and identify disparities. So for example, we can um, consider the incidence of um, cancer across different types of cancer and how that's distributed ac across different types of regions, so major cities versus uh, regional or remote areas. Of, or we can consider comparing the colorectal cancer relative survival curves between major cities and very remote areas. So the model estimates allow us to get answers to questions like how many premature deaths could be prevented if there were no spatial inequalities. So making private data open through modelled estimates allows decision makers to make evidence-based decisions such as where to allocate resources to reduce spatial disparities. So I'm going to hand back to Kerry now to discuss the federated learning approach to open data. Okay, thanks very much Helen. So um, one other approach that we've been looking at is uh, how to not bring all the data together. Uh, in Australia, we have the different, the registries for cancer are held by the different states and we need special permission uh, to bring those data together. Uh, so an alternative to that is the federated learning approach that we've been developing methods for. So this is the analysis of the data without the data leaving the source. So we can leave the data with the cancer registries and then we can do the analysis in the cloud. Now this avoids ethical, legal, political, administrative and computational barriers to combining the data from the different sources. It increases the control for, from the data custodians. It then gives us the potential to improve data quality and timeliness because the data custodians are, are, are um, guarding that data and, use, and um, curating it. And it also increases the inferential capability from these small or dispersed data sets by still bringing them together. 
So federated learning in the context of digital data platforms has really become a, an issue and a question and for example can make a big change to healthcare and to predictive maintenance and to many other areas. So it's easier, safer and cheaper to apply machine learning in the world's most regulated, competitive and profitable industries using federated learning. IBM Research in 2022 uh, had a statement that this new form of AI training called federated learning um, is becoming the standard for meeting a raft of new regulations for handling and storing private data. And there's a whole lot of interesting interest and in literature about federated learning, but there's not so many practical applications of this work. And so what we've been doing over the last five years is, is trying to apply federated learning for uh, digital platforms like the Cancer Atlas. So as a, as a pictorial overview of federated learning then, we leave the data with the custodians and then we do local updates of those data, we request local updates of those data, but those local updates then are incorporated into the overall analysis. Now the data that's with the custodians can either be through horizontal data, which means that every data custodian holds all of the information that we require, so all of the variables, but only a subset of the total uh, data that we require. In a vertical setup, each of the uh, data custodians holds a subset of the variables uh, for all of the observations. And so it's different ways that we are looking to be able to combine data in this federated learning approach. To date, we've been looking mostly at the horizontal uh, federated learning, and that's what I'll talk about here, but we have been starting to look at vertical federated learning as well. And I know that there will be people who are listening to this who are experts in federated learning, and I'd be delighted to talk about it with you after the, uh, the presentation. So federated learning in the context of the Australian Cancer Atlas then, is that we want to combine these data sets across states and also then to think about combining the information that we've gathered from Australia with other countries. And the inspiration for this is through uh, the Cancer Registry in the Netherlands. So this is IKNL that has an open source platform called um, Vantage 6. And IKNL have been using this um, platform and developing their federated learning approaches, for example, to combine data from the Netherlands and Taiwan from the Dutch Cancer Agency and the National Registry, the Netherlands and Italy and so on. So there's no way that those countries are going to share the original data, but they can share um, the analysis through this federated learning approach. So it's quite exciting. And the way that this might work then for a general linear model is that we can extract the information about components of the analysis that we require from the individual data custodians or the individual data sets and those components then are what's combined into the overall analysis. So, and then we obtain the, the estimates of interest. Now, this, this means that this is not just an algorithmic exercise, it's actually a way of an opportunity for us to rethink the models that we're using, or the statistical models, in order to be able to capitalise on this uh, federated learning approach. So um, open questions then in federated learning that we've been looking at is that currently only limited types of models are available. So uh, common uh, models include GLMs, generalised linear models, Gaussian processes, neural nets, and none of these have naturally silo specific variables. And so we ask the question, can we fit gener generic structured probabilistic models in the federated learning setting? And can we accommodate heterogeneous data and partially siloed data, and these are important for the context of our application. So the current approaches then, we have uh, our observations, why, and we have the same parameters for each party, each of the nodes. Uh, for example, that, that's the setting of a of generalised linear model or general linear model. And in our interest then is in Bayesian structured models, and there's a whole raft of these kinds of structured models. So hierarchical or mixed effects models, person or, er person or area level random effects, fully or partially pooled regression, temporal effects, disjoint spatial random effects and so on. So what we want here are some parameters that are local to the, uh, to the node and those local parameters will be governed by global parameters as well 
that will be also governed then by Harper parameters theta. And we're going to do the estimation then for this uh, approach and especially in the context of the data that we have, which is relatively large and or computationally intensive through a variational inference approach to reduce that computational resource. So the, the um, variational inference approach then in a nutshell is to say that if we think about our posterior distributions for, for the parameters of interest or, the, or the, um, the variables or constructs of interest, then around the mode, uh, it's pretty typically something that could be approximated by a parametric distribution, like a normal distribution. And so we can uh, choose an approximation to that posterior distribution that is going to allow us to um, have that um, to make this faster. So we have the parametric approximation, and then we update our, param our variational parameters via gradient descent. And finally, then we have an objective function, which is going to be the lower bound of the evidence. And the evidence here is given by the difference between the log of the posterior distribution of interest and the log of this, um, this approximate um, distribution. So we've been developing then a structured federated variational inference approach and uh, we have variations of this as well but for this one we have the um, in a distributed inference setting we have the gradient information is with respect to the, the, um, the, the global parameters and they're communicated to the server at each iteration and return then we will have the exact variational approximation as in standard settings. So what we have then is our, if we start from the bottom equation, our observations given our local parameters and our global parameters. The second, uh, the middle equation says that those local parameters are governed by the global parameters. And then we also have the global parameters of interest as well. So we're building up this model so we can have local um, information and then we also have global information. And so the model classes that, that this includes are basing hierarchical models, topic models, hierarchical variational autoencoders, and so on. So a wide range of models. And what we see when we do this, um, one of the, the approaches we can use is in also incorporating dependent effects. And so when we do this, we get slight differences in the, um, in the parameters of interest, but really close, especially when we take into account the computational uh, improvements in this kind of model. So that then brings us to the, uh, the second objective that Helen outlined. So we've been through how we might create open data from um, private data, either through the development of uh, spatial models or through uh, federated learning approaches or a combination of both. But then we can also look at the, the second objective or challenge is in complete data. So where we have the full data for the cancer uh, uh, outcomes of interest, we also want to consider risk factors. And those risk factors are often obtained through uh, surveys. And so for this might be about smoking and obesity and, uh, and other sorts of risk factors on cancer. And so the, 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 for our, in our case then, we have an Australian Bureau of Statistics National Health Survey, which is quite a large survey with really relevant information. But even though it's a large survey, over the span of Australia, it's actually small areas um, have very small sample sizes. And so we, and additionally, we only have samples for about 70% of areas and they're not random. So um, we have about 50% of our areas of interest, the small area at level two, are either non-sampled or they're unstable because of small numbers. So the question then is how do we provide complete open data or complete data from this survey information. So current small area estimations for proportions, the proportion of people over a certain um, threshold for, for weight or a proportion of smokers in, a, in an area um, require us to have individual level models. And this requires the covariate, for, covariate data for all the population individuals. We can't use survey only covariates and we can only adjust for the sample design via modeling rather than by sample weights. At the area level model then, um, we have very small sample sizes, so we have very unstable direct estimates and we don't have enough understanding of the performance 
for these non-sampled areas to be able to use this approach. So what we've been thinking about to, uh, to address these issues is a two-stage model. So in the first stage then, we do a pseudo likelihood logistic mixed model um, for the sampled areas. And we take those sampled area estimates then, and we put those into a second stage, which is a logistic normal model um, over all of the areas. So we predict then into the unsampled or unstable areas, and that gives us then the final estimates at the area level. Now this two-stage model increases stability, increases smoothing, and increases coverage. So a little more about this um, is that we have at stage one, we have the individual level model, which is our YIJ, so a person is a smoker or not a smoker. So that's a Bernoulli distribution with an un underlying probability for that person um, uh, for, um, at the I uh, region and the J person. We can then undertake a logistic model, which is going to incorporate some uh, fixed effects um, as we need to, and then we have individual level data and individual level estimates that are going to come out of that. So we have our estimates with the sampling variances. We then can transform that to a logistic transform so that it's more normal. And then we go to our second area level model where we combine, uh, we take out our estimates that we have for the different areas and now we fit this, um, this model uh, at the area level for all of the areas here. And we can use census variables uh, that we have over all of the areas in this second stage. So the final estimates that we have are the posterior distributions for the parameters of interest over all of the areas um, of Australia. And so this is a, a really um, exciting way of being able to use survey level data uh, and some census level information at the area, survey, survey level data at the individual level and then so, uh, census level data at the area level to obtain the estimates that we want. So when we apply this to the Australian Cancer Atlas, you can see, for example, the survey areas. We have five risk factors that we're interested in here. And what we can do with this then is we can fit the stage one model with um, some fixed effects and some random effects as shown here, and a stage two model again with fixed effects and, um, and a spatial random effects here. And uh, we can then obtain from that um, results which will give us posterior estimates for each of the re uh, regions, for each of the, uh, the risk factors of interest. And we can also then map those, um, those results as estimated proportions. And this information then can be made available as open data. So we can also obtain not just the estimates, but we also obtain the uncertainty of those estimates. And there's still another open question about how we educate people about um, the use of this uncertainty for decision making. Uh, that's a story for another time. So um, what I'll do now then is hand back to Helen to talk about the third challenge, which is interpretable data. Thanks, Harry. Okay, so the task of uh, transforming uh, intricate patterns in the data into a narrative can be challenging. So it involves developing uh, visualizations and methodologies to allow decision makers to, to um, extract useful insights without getting lost in all of those intricacies. So making data interpretable uh, means making even the most complex data accessible um, and actionable. So the Australian Cancer Atlas uses a number of visualizations to make the data accessible to a diverse audience, including the general public. So for example, there's the, the, the map itself. There are information windows that help the user to uh, interpret what it is they're seeing. We saw earlier that we can look at a particular um, area and, and compare the um, cancer risk within that area or, or um, compare the cancer risks across the two different areas. Um, and also there, there's information such as you know, the uncertainty in the, um, the estimates. So the, the way that we communicate, so what we choose to communicate and where we communicate um, the information requires a lot of um, a thought and a lot of discussion, um, collaboration, and um, can even require potential user testing. 
So for example, um, in the Australian Cancer Atlas, um, a plot called the V plot is, is used to communicate uncertainty in the estimates. But um, other options such as those that are displayed on the screen um, at the moment were possible. Okay, we can also, uh, there's also the potential of, of um, getting added value out of um, our maps by um, including uh, some spatial clustering. So that's where we apply some clustering methods to identify spatial areas uh, that are, are similar in some way and, and group them together. So we've seen that digital platforms like the Australian Cancer Atlas can be effective conduits for open data. Well, we've seen how the Australian Cancer Atlas addresses the issues of private data through spatial models and federated learning, complete data through two-stage modelling, and interpretable data through visualisations and inferences. So just to solidify the power of digital atlases like the Australian Cancer Atlas, the spatial disparities in cancer risk that were highlighted through the um, Cancer Atlas uh, led to a policy change that saw people in regional areas being able to access travel funds to um, access health services. So that, that was a pretty fantastic outcome. Um, so I think that's the end of our presentation. So uh, thanks for following along with us. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more of the technical information behind the Cancer Atlas or uh, some of the related works of what we've been discussing today that um, our team's been working on, so you can see, you can visit the, the links in our references. Okay, thank you. I just, I'll just move to the, see if there's anything in the questions. So the question is, what application is being used here for this data visualization? Uh, I'm okay. I'm not sure which. Yeah, so this, um, so the the the, um, the atlas was built on Mapbox. Uh, so that's the main um, package. And so there's been a change. We've got a version two of the atlas that's um, going to be released later this year. That's going to have uh, spatial and temporal um, components to it. And uh, again, that will be built on a um, on that platform. But we're also considering some other more open platforms and. Very happy to hear of some other success stories and digital platforms as well from participants. Uh, I think a, a lot of the information that people might want to find, uh, can, if you just search for the Australian Cancer Atlas, then you'll see the website. The website has resources on it uh, and uh, lots of information. There's um, a technical manual there about the development of the models. There's more information about the visualisations and uh, there'll be papers that'll be coming out soon with our, our co-authors on the uh, the, the two-stage model for the for the coverage national coverage for risk factors so i guess watch this space <laughs>